We're back with more of Hall Monitor here on WPPM 106.5. And we're here with, forgive me, I'm having one of those days. Um, and we are here with um, Keisha Hudson. She is the head of the Defenders Association of Philadelphia. These are the people who give you, you know, when you hear your um, Miranda rights, and it says you have the right to an attorney, and if you can't afford one, what will be provided by the state? That is the job that Ms. Hudson does here in Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, late last night, we're, we're recording this on Tuesday, um, a pretty unprecedented thing happened with the Supreme Court in that a draft of one of their opinions, specifically one on the, the at, on Roe v. Wade, the decision that made um, abortion legal, um, was released to the public. And under this decision, as it's currently drafted, um, the right to choose is about to go away. Um, I, I guess I wanted to start off by asking you, have you seen this draft opinion? What did you think? And if I'm, a, you know, if I'm a woman in Philadelphia, what does this mean for me? Right. Um, I, I did see the, the draft opinion. I didn't I didn't read the entire opinion, um, but but read enough to. Um, you know, where uh, some alarms were, were sounded, I think, for me and, and any woman uh, reading that draft opinion last night. Um, you know, I think for, uh, for the courts to, to say that, you know, the right to abortion, um, you know, has no uh, federal constitutional basis um, and that it, it really needs to be left up to the states um, is alarming. And in, in a state like Pennsylvania, we have a, a significant election coming up. Um, the, the House, the Senate uh, is under uh, Republican control here in Pennsylvania. Um, if we have a Republican governor uh, that, is, that, that wins the election, um, we may very well see the, the right to abortion um, you know, go away in Pennsylvania. So I, I think given, you know, given the, 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 the concerns that I think myself and, and many others have about what will happen, um, you know, in this gubernatorial election um, with a Republican and House controlled um, House and Senate controlled uh, uh, legislature, you know, we have we have uh, every right to be concerned. Now, there are other like when I was um, on social media last night and I was hearing about this decision, there were other decisions that were that people were also expressing concern about specifically um, Griswold versus Connecticut, the decision that um, allows birth control to be legal. Um, a lot of people were talking about um, Obergefell, the, the Obergefell decision that um, allowed same-sex sex marriage to be legal. And others were talking about um, decisions that were con directly connected to civil rights because all of what all of these decisions have in common is a right to privacy. Right. Um, is that also something that we need to be looking at as this goes forward? Will I mean, does do Americans have a right to privacy or, or will it, or will we have a right to privacy afterward? I think the, you know, when, when you take a look at the opinion, um, I think anyone, you, you, I don't think you need a legal degree um, to, you know, when you look at this draft opinion to, to see that the court is directly uh, attacking the right to privacy. Um, and, you know, when this case first made its way to, to the Supreme Court, um, you know, there were a lot of, uh, of, of uh, advocacy organizations, women's rights organizations, abortion rights organizations that, that were really, you know, saying that, that the court would never do this. Um, you know, the court, the, the Roe versus Wade and the right to abortion is so enshrined. Um, it is precedent. Um, the court, you know, you know, doesn't have a, a history of, of overturning, um, you know, uh, cases like this. Um, and, and here we are, uh, you know, we, we are on the cusp um, of, of overturning Roe versus Wade. And the heart of the draft opinion is, is an attack on the right uh, to privacy. Uh, you know, the court wants the state legislatures to be able to decide these important rights, um, starting with abortion. But I think 
I think we should be concerned um, that, that this this is only the beginning. Um, I, I do think that that it is possible that that in the future we will see um, the erosion uh, to the right to privacy in other contexts, uh, birth control, uh, interracial uh, marriage, uh, same sex marriage. Um, I think that you know th I think that all of those decisions are in jeopardy. Okay. Now, in terms of what you do in Philadelphia, do you handle these kinds of issues a lot or at all? No, you know, we, we, we don't have, we don't have these issues. Um, you know, we, we represent 70% of, of, uh, of people who are arrested and, and charged with uh, criminal offenses in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, you know, it, it, if we, uh, in the future, uh, if, if Pennsylvania um, does uh, get legislation passed, you know, banning abortion, then it's going to be another, another conversation in terms of what that may look like. Um, for, for anyone uh, violating, you know, violating that law um, and whether or not, you know, a, a prosecutor would decide to, uh, to, to, to charge um, and, and prosecute someone for, for having an abortion. Um, you know, issues that like that may make its way to us. You know, uh, Philadelphia has a progressive prosecutor in Larry Krasner. Um, and so, you know, the, the prosecute, prosecution would have the power to determine um, you know, there are laws on the books, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to prosecute um, anyone for, for violating, um, you know, for violating those laws. Again, it remains to be seen, um, you know, what happens if, he, if, if Larry Krasner decides he's not going to seek re-election um, or if he's, uh, if he's defeated, um, you know, in, 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 the next, uh, in the next election, what that might look like. For right now, it's not, you know, it's not a, a an issue for us. It's not a case that, that comes through our doors. Um, but what the future holds, uh, I think, will depend on, um, you know, depend on on what the political, uh, what the political landscape looks like. How much of your job as the as someone who handles the defense of people who are basically indigent? How much of that? How much of your job depends on political wins because you know when you when you look at how much the defense in in like in your case defender's office gets to do what it needs to do to protect the rights of people who cannot afford an attorney of their own and you look at how much the prosecution almost always gets to try this person there's no way that balances but we were only now having a conversation where we're talking about funding defense at all. So how much of what you do is predicated on politics? It, it very much is. I will say um, Pennsylvania is the only state in the country uh, where the, the state legislature uh, does not provide a single penny to fund public defense systems. We are the only state. Uh, it, it, 67 counties in Pennsylvania, every county um, is, uh, every county public defender is funded by that county government in Philadelphia. We're funded by the city of, of Philadelphia. So we get no funding from the state legislature. And again, the only state in the country um, where, where that is the case. Uh, funding for, for public defense has never been a, a priority uh, for, for politicians. Um, you can imagine that the, the people we represent, all of whom are presumed innocent um, until until uh, found um, until found guilty. Um, you know we all enjoy that presumption of innocence, but once you are caught in the criminal justice system, not the most sympathetic uh, population. Uh, and so uh, we've never been a priority for funding. And in budget cycle after budget cycle in the city of Philadelphia, we see we see that. Um, so my push now to to. Um, you know, to, to increase the, the funding allocation for the Defender Association is, is not new. Uh, chief defenders prior to, to my tenure have been, have been pushing for this, have been advocating for more funding for decades. Uh, our office has been chronically underfunded um, and uh, unless we have uh, people in city council and unless the mayor uh, gets some political courage to, to, to invest in public defense, uh, this is going to be a fight that is going to continue uh, during my tenure and, and possibly long after my tenure. 
Okay. Well, I'd like to turn it over right now to um, Larry McGlynn, my co-host here on Hall Monitor. And, and here you go, Larry. Thanks, Denise. And Ms. Hudson, thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you. I, I, I want to focus a little bit on your office and, um, and and the budget hearing from last week. But before we do that, I just want to bring up one more thing about the, the um, Supreme Court from last night. Um, it, it, and I'm not an attorney and I, I don't know anything. Um, I, so I just want to make that as clear as possible. But one thing that was equally as alarming to me, uh, and I'll just be blunt uh, about this opinion that was leaked is also the other cases that were referenced. Right, right. Um, particularly uh, dealing with gay marriage um, and, and other things that are fundamentally important it, it, it almost felt to me, and again, I'm, I, my uneducated opinion about these matters, that the groundwork may be being laid to, to attack other rights that we've just accepted as human rights. Uh, and I was just wondering, do, do you feel a, a similar sense of concern going forward? I, I do. Um, I, I'm gravely concerned. Um, again, we, we've only seen a first draft. Um, it's not the final uh, final opinion. Um, and so when, when the final opinion gets issued, we'll, we'll see what the court's reasoning is uh, for overturning uh, precedent. Um, but again, from what I've reviewed um, and, and what the court is saying about the right to privacy, um, what the court is saying about uh, this being uh, uh, states' rights and left up to states and looking around the country where there are 13 uh, 13 states that have legislation ready to go mm. to ban abortion and, and presumably others will follow. Um, when I look at states like Pennsylvania, uh, where election, you know, the election is going to decide, you know, who controls, um, you know, who controls uh, the, the, the governor um, position. I, I do think that, that, you know, that we have a right to be concerned that, yes, um, you know, abortion rights um, are, are going away. But what what does what does that mean for other rights, uh, other human rights, um, where the you know at the heart of those human rights is the right to privacy? I think all of all of those rights that that we enjoy um, and have taken for granted are threatened. Yeah, yeah, and and you know as things maybe become a little clearer or we learn more about this, maybe you could come back and, and we could talk more about that at another time, um, because it's it's certainly frightening. Um, it absolutely is. So I, I'd like to shift a little bit to um, your office and particularly the budget hearing last week. And um, <clears throat> this is another thing where you'll have to forgive my ignorance. Um, I, I didn't realize that the public defender's office was not necessarily a city agency. It, 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 it's more of a quasi kind of city agency. Can, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yes, so the Defender Association has actually been around since 1934, um, and the we have uh, an important uh, United States Supreme Court decision, Gideon versus Wainwright, um, which uh, guaranteed the right to counsel for those who cannot afford counsel. But the Defender Association, um, you know, was around for 30 years before that United States uh, Supreme Court opinion in Gideon versus Wainwright. We started as a community defender, uh, a very small organization, um, and today uh, an organization of, of almost 500 uh, staffers. Uh, but we do get um, all of our funding from the city of Philadelphia. We are not considered a, a city agency. Uh, we are uh, run by an independent board of directors. We are a quasi city agency because we have a significant number of the members of our board who are appointed by the city. Uh, so we, we are not a, a city agency. I, I would say we're a quasi city agency, um, and, but we do get all of our funding from the city of Philadelphia. And you said that you have 500 employees. How many of them are our lawyers? We uh, are uh, funded to have about 250 attorneys. So a, a large public defender organization, not the largest in the country, but one of the largest. Um, and we actually do not have enough attorneys to handle um, the, the, the cases that come through the Philadelphia court system, but we are funded to have 250 attorneys. Okay, so 250 attorneys and about how many cases per year 
would you say your your organization handles? Uh, so we represent 70% of the, the cases that come through the criminal uh, Our attorneys appeared in over 200,000 instances where our attorneys were in court on some proceeding from preliminary arraignment to a preliminary hearing uh, to, to trial, um, to sentencing. Um, and so it, it, it's a, a significant caseload. Did, did you say 200,000? 200, 200,000 hearings, 200,000 court appearances, yes. In one year? In one year. For 250 attorneys. 250 attorneys, yes. Oh my goodness. Now, yes. th that right there is, is sort of the, the crux of one of the things you're talking about here. The district attorney's office has about 300 attorneys, but they don't handle as many cases as you do. You know, so that's what is, you know, what is um, important to, to note about the district attorney's offices. While we represent 70% of the cases in Philadelphia, they do uh, take on 100% of the cases. We, we cannot represent everyone charged with a criminal offense who cannot afford counsel uh, due to issues around conflict. Um, so uh, if, if we represent a, a a client um, and their co-defendants um, who are arrested with our client, we cannot also represent the co-defendants. So they get appointed private counsel. Uh, so we, we handle a significant amount of cases. I think what is important to note is that our preparation for these cases uh, is, is, a lot, is a lot more significant than what you would see uh, for the preparation um, of, of a case you know, from a, a district attorney's perspective. We have less resources. The prosecution's office has the entire police department um, as an investigative agency. Um, they have other state and federal agencies that they work with to help them get uh, their cases ready for court. I have investigators. Um, I have 27 investigators, and I, and I think our organization is fortunate to have the investigators. But we, but we have uh, when we compare our resources to the district attorney's office, we have far we have far less uh, resources. Um, so our work looks different, right? It's it's when a case comes into our office, it's the work that the everyone from the administrative staff member is doing to get that case ready to the attorney meeting with the client at the jails, to the investigator who has to look at the case and, and investigate the case, um, to the social worker. And we have social workers who work with our clients to connect them to resources. And, and then the attorney is going into court prepared to, uh, to represent clients who are, um, who are in jeopardy of, of losing, um, you know, losing their liberty. So you have less resources, fewer lawyers, more cases, um, and, and it, it would seem to me that your, your staff does a significant amount of work. When we talk about compensation, um, how is your staff compensated compared to say the district attorney's office or, or other legal entities throughout the city or even the private sector? So that's the entire justification behind my budget push, um, you know, during this budget cycle. Uh, we do not have parity uh, with the district attorney's office and, and our organization is not unique. If you take a look at public defense agencies around the state, um, around the country, uh, it's the rare public defender agency that actually um, is able to compensate its staff at the same a rate um, of a of a district attorney uh, district attorney's office. So our 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 situation is not unique in in that sense. Um, in Philadelphia, uh, just one data point for us. Um, you know the the base starting salary for the district attorney's office is forty thousand dollars. So that's their base. Um, our base starting salary is twenty nine thousand dollars. Um, which qualifies our staff who make $29,000 a year for SNAP and LIHEAP benefits. So that is just one uh, data point that I brought out, you know, during my budget testimony is that, you know, if we can even raise the starting salary um, to, to be on par with the district attorneys, that 29000 raised up to 40000 would have a significant financial impact for our staff. And, and what is the... Uh... The, the starting salary for an attorney? 
The starting salary for an attorney is $57,000. Um, the starting salary for an attorney at the district attorney's office is $64,000. So um, again, you know, we are, we are below, um, you know, where uh, the district attorney's office starts their attorneys, you know, our attorneys make 89 cents to their, to their dollar. And what does that do in terms of retention? Last year was, you know, a, a, a challenging year for us. Um, our organization, like many organizations, you know, in the state, around the country, are, are you know, are facing, are facing attrition. And when I look at the primary reason our, our attorneys and non-attorneys leave the organization, salary is, is the number one issue. Uh, virtually every city agency uh, pays more. Um, virtually every city agency, um, all city agencies are, have a pension um, and our office does not have a pension. We're not part of the city's pension plan. So when I talk to staff who are leaving and I actually do the exit interviews because I want to hear, well, why are you leaving the organization? It is never because of the work. Um, you know, people come to this work because they want to uh, dedicate their, their careers um, to public interest. Mm -hmm. um, they, they care about the clients. Um, they, they are very passionate about the work they do. They are just not paid well enough to be able to support themselves and their families. And they're leaving for other city agencies that are paying 10, 15 or $20,000 more. In addition, they're getting a pension. And, you know, when we're talking about you know, the whole conversation about student loan debt, things like that. Um, it, it makes sense. I, it's understandable that people feel like they have to move somewhere else to make more money in order to keep up with their, their obligations. Correct. I mean, our attorneys are carrying, you know, in excess, uh, many of them in excess of $200,000 in student loans. Um, and, and so that is, that is absolutely a factor um, in, in the decision to, to, to leave the organization. Um, many of them are staying in public defense. Um, they're, they're not changing careers, uh, but they're going to agencies, um, including the neighbor, near, neighboring counties that have now lifted residency requirements. So Delaware County Public Defender's Office lifted their residency requirement. So we had attorneys who um, you know, don't have to live in Delaware County, they can now apply and have applied and are now working in that office. They are getting paid more and they get a pension. Now, why is the Public Defenders Association not in the city pension plan? See, that is a great question. Um, and that came up during the budget testimony last week. Uh, the, the city, we've been having a conversation with the city about um, joining uh, their pension plan. And where it is right now um, is that the, the uh, city uh, consulted with um, a, an outside law firm um, that, that issued an opinion uh, that says that if our organization were to be part of the city's pension plan, the city would lose its tax exempt status. We then went and got our own uh, law firm outside law firm uh, that issued an opinion saying, uh, here are the reasons why that is not a concern. Um, and really I thought compellingly lay, lays out a case for why we can be part of the city's pension plan. It is now up to the city's law department um, to, to make the final call. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's where we are right now. Um, I'm not pushing the issue around pension this budget cycle because it's a conversation that we have been having with the city for years now. Um, mm -hmm. The city is supportive of, and, and we've, we have several city council members who are supportive of our office being part of the pension. The, the question right now is uh, if, if we do become part of the pension plan, you know, does that impact the city's tax exempt status? My take um, and our law, firm, um, law firm's opinion is that it does not. Yeah, and again, I'm not an attorney, but it just seems I, I, I don't understand that argument at all. Um, but it, it just seems natural because you get your funding from the city, you're doing work on behalf of the city that your employees get that benefit. It, it just seems like a no brainer to me. Um, uh, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with you. And I think, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a fight that we're going to continue to, to, to push. Um, uh, and you know, making making the case for why the economic outlook for so many of our employees is bleak uh, because they 
um, uh, do not have a pension. And I'll, I'll drop one other data point that I think is important to note. 15% of the employees uh, of our organization are over the age of 65. So when you look at organizations as large as ours, um, you would not find the that large a number of people who are past retirement age. Um, and to me that that, you know, to me, that's really a compelling point. Our, our staff, while they enjoy the work, while they're committed to the work, literally cannot retire. They do not retire. I have 78 year old and I have an 82 year old staff member here um, and their financial outlook um, is bleak. They have to stay employed in order to support their families because they have not saved enough uh, for retirement. And, and I remember you had mentioned that in the hearing, and that, that's one of the most heartbreaking things because you have people who dedicated their life to public service. And yes. This, yes. this is how they've been rewarded for it. I, I, it, it very troubling to hear that. It um, is. And, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a racial issue um, yes. because the majority of, of our, our non-attorney staff are, are uh, 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 people of color. Uh, they're lifelong Philadelphia residents, um, and they have been working here full time, uh, some for decades, um, and are still at the, at the financial point where um, they either cannot support the fam their families on the salaries they have. So many of them have second and third jobs. Um, and they cannot retire uh, because they have not put away enough for retirement. You can imagine someone making twenty-nine or thirty-three or forty thousand dollars who've been with an organization for forty years. You know, when you're making that little, you're really not able to put enough away for um, for for any sort of retirement. Yeah, that, that's terrible. And, and when we talk about Philadelphia being the poorest big city in America. And we also balance that against the fact that everybody has a right to a defense. I, I just think when we look at how your organization is making this work as well as you can with what you have, um, but you know, you're going to have turnover, which clearly holds things up um, and, and makes things more challenging. Um, and, it, and one point, you know, one point that I, 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 I make is that public defenders are not you know, we're, we're not um, puzzle, you know, we're not puzzle pieces. Um, and so, you know, I, I get asked the question, well, how many attorneys do you have on staff? Um, and it really doesn't matter uh, because when an, ex when an attorney leaves who has three or five or 10 years of experience and we're losing seasoned attorneys, these are the attorneys handling the really serious cases, the gun cases, um, the, the homicide cases, uh, the sexual assault cases. These are really seasoned attorneys um, and trying to replace them is incredibly difficult. I also cannot take an attorney who is six months out of law school, who I may have them on staff to say, okay, now you are going to do this homicide case. Um, and so, you know, the, the challenge here, I think, is trying to get the city, the mayor, um, politicians to understand that that you know that we have to continue to invest um, in in training and invest in retaining our attorneys because they're the ones who um, are going to handle these serious cases and they're going to do it right. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the Defender Association has never had a case come back for wrongful conviction. We've never had a case where where our organization has been sued uh, because someone. Um, got, you know, had their due process rights violated and they sat in jail um, and they were convicted or they may have sat on death row. Um, the, our organization does such incredible work, um, you know, so that these, these issues don't happen. And the city has paid out tens of millions of dollars in wrongful conviction cases um, in, in the past few decades uh, because, um, because it wasn't done right. So when I say, you know, we have to, you know, invest in the public defense, this is, this is what I mean. It's hard to quantify what that, what that dollar amount looks like, but we have the examples of here is a case where someone did not have effective counsel. They did not have trained counsel. Um, they, their due process rights were uh, violated. Um, and now the case is going to stay in the, in the court system for years. It's going to stay in post-conviction for years. It's going to come back through, um, you know, the court system. That costs the city tens of millions of dollars and has cost the city tens of millions of dollars. So invest in us now, invest in us early so we can recruit, retain, um, the, the best attorneys to do the work that we need to do. And also we do more. Um, than, than, than what one would imagine we do in the courtroom through our social services staff. Primarily, we are connecting our clients to resources that are going to help keep them out of the system. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's, 
it's difficult to, to, to really convey to those who can, you know, control the, the purse strings for the city that the investment in public defense really is an investment in not only the people who do this work, uh, but in public safety. And when we talk about, you know, the conversations we've been having in Philadelphia for so long now, racial equity um, and, and fairness, your office, considering again, that we, we are the poorest big city in America, is foundational to equity and and fairness and it, it just i i was uh maybe i shouldn't have been but i was shocked when i heard this testimony and alarmed when i heard it and i i, I you know i thank you so much for coming on and telling us more about this and hopefully more people hear about this because it's it's so important um i'd like to turn it back over to denise clay murray Yes, thank you, Larry, and, and, and thank you so much for joining us, um, thank you. Ms. Hudson. We really appreciate it. I, I guess my last question is, when you go out and you recruit people to become members of the Defenders Association, I guess, what inspires them to want to do this kind of work, especially when you look at some of the obstacles that are placed in, in front of you to do it? Uh, you, you know, I, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, City Council President Daryl Clark made a comment during the budget testimony that, that you know, uh, after I made my pitch uh, regarding our salary inequity, uh, that the people in this organization choose to do this work. Um, we'll, we'll set aside the people who are the non-attorneys um, uh, and focus on the attorneys, you know, uh, to, to answer that question. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the right to counsel, um, you know, we are the only constitutionally mandated attorneys, right? We, we are it, public defenders are the only constitutionally mandated attorneys. And people who come to do this work really have a strong, a uh, sense um, of uh, and a strong commitment um, to to the to that ideal right? that everyone deserves uh, counsel, but they deserve quality counsel. They deserve effective counsel. And they deserve zealous counsel, um, so that we can protect their rights. Um, because everyone who is arrested, um, you know, we are the only ones standing next to them, with them in the courtroom, against the incredibly well resourced arm of the, the state. Um, and so the people that come to do this work really believe in that calling uh, that, you know, that, that I want to be the person standing next to someone who's indigent and standing next to someone who may be uh, themselves a victim of crime. 83% um, of our clients with uh, serious felony charges have themselves been victims of crime multiple times in their lives. They want to stand next to the person who may be suffering from drug abuse, they, who may be suffering from a mental health issue. The majority of our clients have one or more uh, uh, instances of trauma and victimization throughout their lives. And so we come to this work because we really are standing next to um, you know, that person in court um, to say, before you take away my constitutional, uh, you know, before you take away my rights, before you deprive me of life and or liberty, um, you know, before, you know, you sentence me to a period of incarceration, you know, my lawyer is going to make sure that the state does everything that it is constitutionally required to do before that happens. Okay. Well, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. We really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, 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 this is such a, an important issue for us and, and I'm going to continue advocating um, uh, for, for, uh, for an increase in our, in our funding. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you.